So we're talking today about cities, and we have today two cultural leaders from some of the most important institutions that have been um, created in our southern cities in recent history. And um, we were talking a little bit about the origin of those institutions and sort of the 20-year journey for both of you in creating your institutions. Um, and I'd love for you to share a little bit about that with, with this group, and also maybe about um, the place-based importance of where your institutions are located and how that's been important as they've developed. Sure, so I'll uh, start out for the home team. Uh, so we are constructing the International African American Museum uh, here in Charleston, uh, South Carolina. Uh, and in terms of place, space, and I like to use the word reclamation, we're reclaiming um, the portion of a site of Gadsden's Wharf, uh, one of our nation's uh, most prolific uh, transatlantic slave trading ports. Um, so somewhere between 48 and 48% all of Africans who came into what is now the United States would have come in through the site where we are being built. So that's kind of in the, the place uh, making uh, portion of, of what we're doing and we'll talk later about the intentionality of the design. Uh, and it's interesting, if you truly sort of sit down to contemplate all that is required to create this kind of thing, 20 years does not seem like enough time. And if my phone goes off while I'm sitting here, it's because we open on June 27th. <laughs> <laughs> you know, working on <laughs> Stories that we knew we were gonna tell and always were gonna tell really did take on a different shine, sheen, perspective, perhaps the type of artifact um, that we wanted to, to have in that space changes based on what's happening in the world, which is kind of a gut punch to historians uh, in, in terms of that. And so that's part of, of what the 20-year the journey um, was. And then at some point, you do simply have to call time and allow people to paint the walls. Um, and so doing that also makes it, I think, very interesting. Uh, and one of the things we're trying to do now is to discover and define for ourselves what it's going to mean to be a living history museum, as history seems to be the gift that's going to keep on giving. So we're, we're excited about the opening of the International African American Museum, and it's already done, Tanya. So we'll, <laughs> we'll go ahead and claim that. I'm excited to be with you all. Uh, today and we had the privilege of opening it'll be uh, our grand opening was two years this coming Juneteenth um, and so it, it has just been just a minute ago uh, we're still uh, figuring out how to make the boiler work and all those kinds of things I mean it's a it's a really remarkable uh, it's a really remarkable undertaking these kinds of institutions but Way back in 1998 somebody had an idea and said we ought to start a museum and he went and visited with an entrepreneur, a gentleman by the name of T.B. Boyd in Nashville, and the two of them hatched a plan. And then they went down to the Chamber of Commerce and got them to do a feasibility study. And by 2001, there was, that was done. And they said it's going to be tough, but there's a lot of interest in doing it. And they decided to go forward anyway. And, um, and so once again, I mean, that, and then 20 years later, um, it, we opened, and everything that was predicted in that feasibility study was right. Um, you know, we had three or four location changes. Uh, the budget went from 20 million to 65 million and back down to 40 and then back up to 60. Um, and, uh, but we wound up in a great look. We changed the name once or twice uh, along the way and, and, we, and we finally, finally almost got it done. And I'd say almost intentionally because, you know, we have some capital expenditure needs already. And so, you know, it's, it's a, these are very complicated businesses, but I really think that the story that you're telling and the place is really very important. Um, one of the things that, that began to have the pace pick up, and my friend Dr. Hamilton is here and he can attest to this, is, is that when we changed the name, it was originally called the Museum of African American Music, Art, and Culture, um, which was really kind of a fitting kind of a thing to have in Nashville. But when we changed the name to the National Museum of African American Music, it made that much more sense. Not just for the people who had envisioned it and the people who were gonna be the most invested in it emotionally, but for the city itself. It fit, Nashville is Music City. And the definition of that in many of our minds is CMA Fest, which is celebrating 50 years this, this year and this week, and I'm happy to not necessarily be in town right now. <laughs> 
um, although we love the bachelorettes and the fun that they have in our place. Um, but it, we have it that does, here too. It, yeah, but it does hell, hell on the traffic. So, um, you know, but, but it really became something that those who were beyond the most invested could also understand in the context of what our culture and what our community is. Music is something that we take very seriously in Nashville, whether it's in the honky tonks or otherwise. And then on top of that, what a lot of people don't realize is that the idea of Music City was originally an African American concept uh, and, and even an Afro European concept, as it was the Fist Jubilee singers who went over to London, and I believe it was Queen Charlotte who they had the conversation with, where it's rumored that she said, You all must be from a musical city. And so that's where this came from, but, but that's not been what has been emphasized in the storytelling of what Nashville is. And so what better place to begin to reclaim um, that story than right at Fifth and Broadway in the heart of the city uh, where we have the opportunity not to exclude but to make sure that all of us who are citizens of the city are included. And boy, has it made a difference. That's great. I, I was really interested to hear that you're, you had international in your title before and you renamed it to the National Museum of African American Music. And if we look to the International African American Museum, that seems very deliberate as well. And so I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit, Dr. Matthews, but also when you are looking at such a larger scale, how do you connect with the local as well? You know, that's actually a good point. And as you were uh, telling the, the story, Henry, you know, we, we almost did the opposite. Right, so we were sort of going back and forth and, and figuring out, you know, the naming is, is so important um, and so contentious uh, when, when, you're in, when you're in that room. And because we wanted to sort of be in this space and we had the power of plates and, and part of the, the Charleston roots of the story were indeed in slavery and enslavement, there are those who wanted to focus on that, that, that space and that story and those who considered that wallowing right, uh, and didn't want to do that, and so international was a way to call into that without necessarily forcing folks into that space, very much like, like you said, so folks are curious, oh, what, what do you mean by international African? Well, you have just asked the magic question, and now you're sort of coming to the museum, and so that actually helped us in defining um, who we thought we were going to be in the beginning, and now it's about delivery on a promise, right? And so I think that actually helps us um, to, uh, to be compelling and to move forward. And so then now we're a national museum with an international lean based in the home of Charleston, right? Okay, right, so you, got, you gotta get all, all the stakeholders. You, you, gotta, you gotta get all the stakeholders in there. Um, but it was interesting um, because I'm you know, from the Washington DC area and as I came and I'm in this role in preparing, what I realized is actually South Carolina, Charleston in particular, is the root of a lot of the stories, the national stories and the international stories that we tell, essentially because of the impact of Gadsden's Wharf, right? And so part of the way we acknowledge and talk through the home team is you always have choices um, and examples. Our, our easiest example is when we do talk about, say, the institution of slavery, most of the country talks about cotton. We talk about rice. If you hadn't had rice in Charleston, you're missing it. Um, but so it's, it's those kinds of things, right? It's a national story because it's actually the fundamental source of American wealth, but Charlestonians consider that a Charleston story. They consider that a, a local story. And so that's part of the way that we do that. Uh, the other uh, way is that um, we've designed for gathering. Uh, and for community space. And so while our visitors are gonna, you know, in many ways have to be a one and done, right? They're gonna come in, they're gonna visit, they're gonna experience, they're gonna have conversation for a day. Um, but for our local community, um, building a space that allows for gatherings and, and programming and thinking through that is a really good and important way of doing that. And the last thing that I would say is, is what I call being the, the gently pink elephant in the room. 
um, which is we now do have this, this very large anchor institution telling these very intriguing stories. And it does put this interesting gentle pressure on our fellow institutions and businesses in our communities to try to figure out what part of that story they also fit in. And so it opens incredible doorways to partnership. We partner with the Gilead several times and we're gonna do that again. Um, and so I, I think that that's the other way that we think through about the local community, which is sort of the museum without walls and not allowing the story to be relegated to our 160,000 square feet. Yeah, I mean, it's, and I would, I would echo much of what you said, and you use the word story so many times, and I, I think about uh, my job, and it is, not only is it the institution's job to tell stories, but it's my job to tell stories. It's probably the thing that I spend the most time doing. And so when I think about our name, um, I think you're absolutely is so much in there. And so it kind of started with, what are you actually trying to achieve? What are you trying to do? Um, so number one is, I'm trying to tie into my local community. If we're Music City, then music should be the focus of, of the name of the institution. But we're also really intentional, the, the, the genesis of the idea, and I make mention of the fact that it started in some ways in the Chamber of Commerce. It didn't start in the Tourism Bureau, it started in the Chamber of Commerce. It didn't start in the Community Center, it started in the Chamber of Commerce. The goal was to make money. The goal was to drive economic impact. And so how did we want to drive that economic impact? Tourism, right? So the tourism was the, the means to the end. And so by putting national in the name, the idea was to convey that we want to attract a different type of tourist to come and be interested in our city. So we are the counterpart, if you will, to the Country Music Hall of Fame. Um, but not everybody who comes to Nashville is ex super excited about the Country Music Hall of Fame. Many people are, but not everyone. And so let's give them something else to do. And so that was really a part of it. And, and then, Tanya, you mentioned the idea of a museum without walls, and we really started there. Um, uh, I was actually in this job for eight years before we broke ground. And so we had to, and, I had, and it, it really took me about six or eight months kind of in the job, and I was moving around town asking people for money. And finally, somebody stopped me and they said, you keep asking me for money for a building but you're not asking me for money for the mission. Ask me for money for the mission, and then I can help you. And then if you can amplify the mission, maybe you can justify the building. And so that's what I began to do, and that begat the Museum Without Walls, and it endeared us to the community because we were all of a sudden in and around the community doing things and telling stories and educating kids in a way that nobody else had been doing. If I can piggyback on that just a little bit, you know, so you mentioned you started in the Chamber of Commerce, um, and we started with our former mayor reading a book uh, that actually changed his life. Uh, former mayor um, Joseph P. Riley, uh, junior mayor for 42 years, um, considered one of America's great mayors, had done amazing things. He's essentially the reason Charleston is no longer just a wharf, right? Um, that, that we are now the number one tourist destination repeatedly read a book, changed his life, decided that we needed a museum that told these kinds of stories. And I double emphasize that because I think a lot of communities mistake arts and culture institutions as a bow or a ribbon or a cherry on top as opposed to an integral part of the fabric of the economy of the community. And so, and that leads to the kind of underfunding um, that actually makes that come true. So one of, I think, the unique and powerful things about our origin stories is that we actually have our roots uh, in folks who sort of have that mindset and actually understand how important it is for the bigger picture. And so while we're talking mission um, to those who are not necessarily in that space, who are being pulled in and motivated that, significant public support, not just financial, but uh, political and interest support that comes in our direction 
is, is how we get to be who we are. When we open our doors, we'll be um, the second largest history museum of African American history in the country. You should see my energy bill. This is expensive. Um, and so, so thinking about how to do that, but I do want to sort of reiterate that around this concept that arts and culture and these places for gathering are not what makes our communities beautiful. It's what actually makes our communities profitable, successful, economically sustainable. It's why we actually grow. But you know, I think, it, I think it's really important you point out that sometimes that gets lost. Um, I've been doing some work on this uh, lately in Nashville, and the, the top five arts and culture institutions in Nashville have an economic impact of roughly $200 million a year and employ, I don't know, 2,000 people or something like that. The Metro Arts Commission budget in Nashville annually is $2.5 million. So, you know, my budget, my budget, just my one little budget for my little new institution is many, 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 many times that. And so how are we doing this? How are we doing this work? Um, and the city is not investing in that work the way that they could or they should. And so, you know, that's that's a discussion that we're beginning to have in Nashville. It's a it's an election year. So we're uh, <laughs> Oh my goodness, there's so many directions to take this. <laughs> Um, absolutely, and I think we found that we saw that during COVID as well with the federal funding that came to a lot of the cultural institutions that wasn't there before and has really enabled a lot of people to think beyond the, the initial kind of bill at your doorstep. Um, and just, just an aside, of course, I, I run a performing arts institution and we also deal with the same issue. We are a building, a fancy building, and I think a lot of the community focuses on that and bringing it back to the mission is so important um, in all art forms. Um, but so let's get back there because I think you are both opening museums at an important time for our community and our important time for creating dialogue within community. Um, you know, we think about uh, the importance of social justice movement, of racial justice, injustice in particular in our country. Um, and uh, we think about the, the moment when your museums are opening. And what is the role of your cultural institutions in particular in creating dialogue and, and being part of that um, solution? I think one of the interesting things about uh, museums is our superpower, one of our many superpowers. Um, our superpower is that we are one of the few remaining, remaining places where you are allowed to, rewarded to, expected to learn in public, right? Learn in public. Even if you consider, say, our classroom spaces, you're still expected to know stuff, right? That's why we give you a test, right? There's certain things you're supposed to know even before you walk in the door. Museums are different. The reason you go to the museum is because you're curious about something you don't know. I can tell you right now, if you came through my museum and you already knew everything that was in there, I'd get the comment card. It's pretty, but I didn't learn anything. Right? So this is a really interesting space because one of the things that's happening, I think, in these very loud conversations is sort of people kind of dodging around what we do know, what we don't know, who should know this, who should know that, and some embarrassment around should I or should I not know. And so you come into a space like a museum, and the whole point is you don't know this. That's why we got to build this. And it's a place where folks can actually learn. There's something very, very interesting that happens in that space. So at the end of the day, I think that is one of um, the, the, the biggest impacts um, that a museum like ours can have. Um, I earnestly believe that while there are a few of us who like to, to rattle sabers very, very loudly uh, in public, the significant majority, like, can I, just, can I just have a conversation? Is there somewhere I can go? Can I just look at a book or a picture or, can I actually talk to a person from the other side and, and see kind of what's going on there? Museums are actually designed to be those spaces. So I think that's it. The other thing is that we are not above the bait and switch. If it takes a red rice cooking competition for me to get you in the building to understand that this is related to West African cuisine and then I get to explain how they got it, I will do it. 
I will do it. And so, so I think... So, so I, th I think that's the other thing, right? So, so we have other ways, gentler ways of sort of being in these space, in these, these, these conversations, and that's the big picture. And then I will also say authentically, you know, as someone who is African American, who my stories are told in there, there's something powerful about being seen. You know, I watch folks go in there and their eyes light up. We literally have pictures of little girls getting their hair braided you know, on, on some of our screens. And to see that elevated to like museum quality status, uh, it really means something to be in that space and to, and to be seen. And so I think for, for many, it's a place for, for conversation. For others, it's a place uh, to be seen. Um, and uh, and I, so I, I'm hoping that that's kind of how and where we fit uh, into that conversation. Yeah, I, I love the idea of, of the bait and switch. One of the things that I have been talking about for a number of years and I do, I really do, is I've been talking about this idea of I can't wait to do the Elvis Presley exhibit in our museum. And, and, when, I, and when, I, when I talk about that, you should hear the, you know, you know like, how fast can he sell out? But wait a minute. You know, let's understand this story of Elvis Presley. And I think the recent movie uh, last year or two really kind of highlighted the African-American music influences on Elvis. How, how significant it was. And so I, one of the things that is that I, I like to do and I don't like to do is probably about once a week or so, I'll walk out of the front door of the museum and I'll walk across the street and I'll stand near the Ryman Auditorium and I'll just turn around and I'll look back. And I'll just watch the front door of the museum. And one of the things that I see that, is, that causes me my blood to boil is I watch people walk by the door and, and, in large numbers, walk by the door. And I wonder why they walk by the door. Why don't more of them stop and look in or pull on the handle? But so many of them walk by the door. And, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's, oh, goodness gracious, I'm a capitalist at heart and I don't understand this. Um, we need to solve for this problem. And so my team will tell you that I come back in the museum talking about solutions to the problem. But a part of it is our name. And we wrestle with this. We, our name, we have this designation in our name that might scare people. It says African-American in the name. So does that suggest that if you're not African-American, you're not welcome? Well, you know, and I even tell my marketing team, we were talking earlier today, all the time, African-American modifies the music, not the people. And so this African-American music is all of our music, but that gets lost. It's too easy if you're there for country music, you're not gonna think necessarily this is my place. So one of the things we, we've studied, should we change the name, what should we do? You know, there's all kinds of reasons not to do that and you know, it becomes a real thing. But one of the things that we did was we commissioned a piece of art to hang right inside the door of the museum and it's called One Nation Under a Groove Box Set. One Nation Under a Groove, and I, there's a whole talk that I give on the, the significance of this song, but the idea is that we are, in fact, we should be One Nation Under a Groove, and, and coming out of the Vietnam War, we were kind of in this moment when George Clinton wrote this song of really, how do we bring the country back together? Um, the idea of civil rights was very much on, on many people's minds, and, and sort of suggesting that as a people, our country has to come together. And it's beyond race, it's beyond ethnicity, and we can all listen to this music and, and enjoy it together. And we hope that that does something to draw people into the museum. And so you're right, I mean, we are kind of these places where people can come in and they can learn and they should feel free and they should feel welcome and they should understand they're not gonna know everything when they come in and, and the idea is that they should feel more empowered and more knowledgeable when they walk out. That's wonderful, and and actually leads right into the next question, which is, um, you know, we are indeed at a at a um, conference talking about urbanism, and you are, you know, leaders of a physical institution, and a lot of times these museums are built with star architects, and they're intended to be icons unto themselves, and how do you create a sense of accessibility, sort of, you know, building on some of the stuff that you were mentioning just now with the physical architecture and connecting it to the city? Is that something you've been thinking about or have thought about? 
So, you know, I have both the, the advantage and the disadvantage, uh, different in the story from Henry. So I've been at the helm over this, this tail end to, to take us to the space, only about two and a half years. And so some of the things that, that I'm looking at, there, there are conversations I'm glad I was not in the room for. Um, and one of them is Charleston, our cultural brand is history. That's, that's the brand of Charleston. That goes to the architecture as well. We have a modern design for our museum. That right there, how to figuring out how to have a wonderfully modern design. The first time I went over to, to Lissa's place, the Gilead, I lived, oh, what is the, they, they, they rehab like a hundred year old building? She was like, no, no. <laughs> It's like five or six years old because that's the way we, we sort of build into sort of into the space and into the architecture. And so for many reasons, though, we needed to have a different look and a different feel because we were trying to say we're going to do some different things. It's a very interesting space, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, this intentionality around design and what things look like. Are they welcoming? Are they not welcoming? Um, so for example, you know, we're also right on the water. So actually, we're going to have a, an interesting but kind of different mind. Why are people just sitting on my mounds and not coming in the building? They will be at the building because we have an entire an, an external garden space and it's lovely and it, it also has its interpretive elements. But you know, our challenge will be, I'm going to need you to get out of the garden, come into the building. Um, I'm like, do I have to sell Charleston Chewies or what? Um, and I believe food solves everything. Um, and so, so as we think through that, I think it's really, really um, important. And I definitely resonate with this, this whole, it's, it's the name. And I want folks to kind of settle into the challenge because if you think about, um, say, if you want to go to the, the Chinese Art Museum, right, or uh, the Mexican American History Museum, it's a little different right now than going into the African American History Museum, right? Even folks with the best intentions are wondering, is it appropriate for me to be in there? Is it their space? Like they, they've said they need space. You know, is that their space where they can tell their story and have their own conversations? And so you've got all of this that's sort of going on. And so this intentionality about welcome is actually a bit of microcosm around the way urban environments think about how do we get people to stay downtown after 4.59 p.m., right? It's literally the same design question. Because during the day, it has to be work. It has to be appropriate for business and efficient. And it has to say, we're going to get things done. But at 5 o'clock, it better say, now chill. Ha have a drink, congregate, just hang and do nothing. Those are really different uh, sensations. And you know what I've learned and what we're, we're working with um, is that design makes a very, very big difference um, in the sense of welcome, pre-welcome that you actually give to your audience. And it also sends cues for behavior. Uh, in the spaces. And so I think those are some of the things that we think about sort of being inside of kind of an urban environment, but also an environment whose brand is history, yet we're sort of the modern one, uh, one out. I mean, we're not as jarring as when they put, you know, the, the glass pyramid on top of the Louvre. It's, it's, it's not that. And see, this is the group that knows that. Okay, so it, it's, it's not that, right? So it's, it's not that jarring, but it is, it is different uh, in terms of that. You know, I would say in our case, uh, you know, I, I, I want to say no. I mean, I, it was it was uh, it was much more utilitarian uh, than than focusing on in particular exterior design. Um, we we wanted to maximize physical square footage. We wanted to be where the people were, um, and then as as we moved along in the process, we wanted visibility, and so we did some things. We we put up some digital billboards on the exterior of the museum and kind of started with this notion that we were going to keep 70 percent of the space on those boards for us to market and advertise museum programming and sell the remaining 30 percent or so we're selling 70 and we're keeping 30 and, it, and it's it's a good thing <laughs> it's a good thing um, but on the inside much more so uh, intentional about design uh, again, places where people can sit and congregate and relax, and even into the, the technology that we put into the exhibits themselves. So 
it, it has driven us to figure out how to get people not just in the lobby, but all the way into the exhibit. And what I've found is that once I do that, people get stuck. And that's a good thing. And then they come out and they're looking for more and they go away and they tell other people about it. So much more energy went into the design inside, uh, in our case, than on the exterior, for better or for worse. That's interesting. All right, we, we only have a couple more minutes. And so I know everybody in the room is curious about the, the your museum opening very, very soon in just a couple of weeks. Um, can you give us a little sneak peek about what to expect or what is inspiring you or what you expect will inspire audiences as you start to welcome them? Yeah, so for better or for worse, it's never as simple as just unlocking the front door. Um, and so um, we actually open a Juneteenth week. It's kind of an inside joke right now. Open a new black museum, Juneteenth. Okay. Yes, you're allowed to laugh because the black girl said it. Um, so, so, um, so we we actually begin that that week. We start with a worship service. It's lovely being in the deep south. Worship services are allowed even for public private partnership institutions. Uh, so we're starting at one of the most historic churches, uh, Morris Brown AME, uh, on the the, um, the Thursday uh, evening of the 22nd. Then on the 23rd, we're going to get all dressed up, have a little bit of a gala. And then on Saturday, which is the anchor moment, we have the official dedication of the building. Um, we've got three sites, because after 20 years, there are a lot of folks that want to see what we're up to. So we're, we're having folks gather um, at the museum. We're taking over Marion Square, which is its own very historic place uh, in, in Charleston. Look it up, all the kind of things happen in Marion Square. Um, and, so, um, and so we can hold three, 4,000 folks there. That's our community dedication watch. But what we decided to do in the name of sort of like access and really having folks involved, it's a dual broadcast. So some of the live portions of the dedication actually happen at Marion Square and they're broadcast to the museum and some other portions are live at the museum and they're broadcast into Marion Square so that they're both actually those special spaces both have VIP zones um, and then for uh, for folks who just want to watch we've got a, a, a brunch uh, that's happening at the Bennett Hotel which is right next to Marion Square uh, so that folks can also look and participate we've got some stars coming my marketing teams that I couldn't tell you which ones, um, but but the, but there are going to be some folks that 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 are that are coming. Um, I would say that in now what's almost standard, we are having uh, an original poem created by a, a, an artist whose name uh, you will uh, recognize. Uh, and then the following Tuesday, after we take down all of the seats and the fences and the balloons and the ribbons, uh, we actually open uh, to the general public for our first full operating week. I am pleased to to announce that we are actually officially sold out uh, for, for opening week. Thank you. Um, but uh, if you become a member at a certain level, I can help you out uh, in, in terms of that. And so, so that's what we're well, thank you both very much. It's a privilege to sit here on stage with you. Um, we're very excited to open your museum, and hopefully we'll have a chance to come and visit you in Nashville, too. Please do. Thank you.